Howdy, folks. Welcome to Grounded, a Homeland Properties Roundtable podcast where we discuss land, timber, real estate, and everything in between. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to Grounded, a Homeland Properties Roundtable podcast. Today, um, we have some of our agents here with us, Robbie Flack Langley and Scott Ratcliffe and myself, Michelle Arnold. Um, we're going to be discussing um, timber in the real estate market. Um, Scott is very knowledgeable about timber and was a former forester, still is a forester technically, uh, was a client and now is one of our agents here at Homeland. And so he has a lot of insight that he would like to share with us today. It's good to be here with you. Um, some of my favorite subjects, timber and forestry and land. Uh, just a little bit about my background. So I went to forestry school at SFA graduated in 1992 and um, when I was there I, I spent a lot of time working for other foresters um, while I was in school and uh, immediately when I got out and did a lot of marking timber a lot of cruising timber um, marking timber is where you just work your way through the woods and you mark the trees that need to come out and uh, back then Foresters did a lot of bid sales. They would uh, mark the timber and then put the timber out for bids. And uh, it was and the, the timber buyers would come out, bid on the timber, and pay the landowner in full for it. So I did a lot of marking and then did a lot of cruising. When I graduated, um, I spent most of my time cruising timber. And cruising timber is just another word for inventorying timber. Um, and you know how you how you inventory timber and, and how you lay out your crews really depends a lot on the the variability of the stand the size of the stand and what you're doing is statistically sampling the stand of timber to get a uh, to get a volume of timber that's there and, and then you can convert that to to uh, board footage and tonnage and and then uh, you know you can put a dollar value on it so I did that for a long time, working for foresters, uh, timber buyers. And then in uh, about 1996, a very good friend of mine and I, we went into business together and uh, we went into the timber buying business. And that's what we did every day. We cruised timber every day, um, either sales that foresters put out, we would cruise it to bid on it, um, or just landowners would call us and say, you know, I've got a hundred acres out here. I need to sell it. And we would cruise it and, and bid on it. Um, and then we hired loggers and we owned a logging crew at one time and we would harvest the timber. And then we had contracts at the mills and we'd haul the wood into the mills and the mill would pay us. And hopefully with what they paid us, minus what we paid the logger, minus what we paid the, landowner there would be some left over yeah um so back then land and t timber was was valuable than it is today and land was less valuable so mm -hmm. there was a lot of uh while we were buying timber a lot of landowners would say well i don't want to just sell the timber i'd like to sell the land and so we would pick up some land along the way we'd bid on it just like we'd bid on a track of timber or they'd tell us what, what they wanted and we, we would buy it. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as we went along, markets changed and we might get into this a little bit later, but around the time of the great financial crisis, 07, 08, 09, mm -hmm. timber really struggled. Yeah. And what right after that, we saw that land started really catching a bid, mm -hmm. started going up. And what we discovered was we were more in the land business than we were in the timber business. Yeah. And uh, I think along about 2010, we listed our first property with Homeland. We started out, we tried to sell some ourselves. Yeah. And, and then we, we tried to list with some agents, maybe like near the, or in the nearest town. or, mm -hmm. uh, And we had very poor results with both of those strategies. Um, 
Yeah, and then we hired Homeland in 2010, mm -hmm. probably around then. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. And we we immediately realized the difference. And you know, Homeland. What we noticed was Homeland does a lot of the little things that you have to do to sell land. Yeah. Um, Can you talk about your experience with that for people that you know just like haven't listed something with Homeland or experience that the seller side of you know yeah listing their property i mean us. the difference uh, was just huge it, you know andy and, and his team they don't skimp on anything especially advertising and um, uh, marketing putting together a good marketing package for the land and, and reaching out to to a big diverse buyer group yeah and uh Two, you know, when you when you're selling land, what we realize is you have to have a lot of information about mm -hmm. that land. You need a lot of maps. You need a lot of uh, a lot of things that just the normal MLS in your town will not have. Right. You know, so Andy and Homeland they have you know great staff there at the office that helped put together this this uh, information and get it out on the market. And the just the difference was huge, and we started yeah. selling land, and really we never we never looked back. Homeland Properties is our agent from from then on. Yeah, and you know also Homeland just their relationships with uh, oh just things like surveyors, mm -hmm. title companies. Um, there's just a lot of different uh, professionals that they interact with that help to to uh to through the process of selling land that mm -hmm. maybe you don't or may, maybe not quite as important with houses but with land yeah. it's it's uh it's really important so a lot of those reasons and just being professional land people they they concentrated on or they con still do concentrate on land and know about land and uh, know the type of buyers that are out there and the marketing for land is always seems to be changing. And so oh, yeah. Homeland Properties always kept up with how to reach the, you know, you really want your property in front of as many eyeballs as possible, mm -hmm. right? Well, it's most definitely changed from 2010 when you first started working with yeah. us to now, 2024. Right. And I remember, I think, I think we had a, I'm sure we had a website in 2010, but it's a much different than <laughs> now in 2024. Right. I remember our old website was just, uh, you know, like almost links just like on a page and, and people loved it back then. But yeah. now thinking back to it, it was so rudimentary, but it worked for the mm -hmm. time. Exactly. Uh, but I think we've kept up with the times too and gone through multiple iterations of new websites to, um, you know, just upgrade and, and make sure our sellers are still getting as much value as they can out of our marketing. Exactly. And, and I do think you're right from a standpoint too of stating that the MLS sites don't always have all of the information that like a buyer wants to see. Yeah. And so, I mean, just from my perspective of answering the phones and just getting those buyers to either the listing agent or an agent that they can work with, they don't understand that our website has so much more information than a lot of the local MLS sites do. Mm -hmm. And so, not only does it have more information, but it's way more accurate because uh, we are updating that daily. And sometimes people think these sites like Realtor.com and Zillow and Trulia have all this like correct information, but in reality, it's just a third-party website that's just taking data and it's yeah. not always correct. And yeah. so yeah. we always do try to steer people to our website and we've revamped it many times. and come a long way from 2010 to yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one thing we noticed as time went along, you guys kept up with the changes and, and it takes staff, it takes resources to oh, do yeah. that. And that's unique to Homeland Properties. I don't think most brokers just put that type of uh, energy and resources yeah. into it. So yeah. we never look back. And I really enjoyed transitioning into the land business and uh, 2019, I came to Andy and I said, well, if, I, I really have enjoyed working with y'all. I, I like the professional atmosphere and I I would like to get, you know, my license and become an agent. And he said, yeah, sure. And I, 
I'm, I hope I've been able to help people, uh, you know, find timberland that they like and sell and sell oh, yeah. timberland they need to sell and just use my experience and knowledge in that in that area to help people out. So it's been five years and I've, I've really enjoyed it and, yeah, and well, hope to continue. I think especially where you're at in Lufkin, um, you know, you're able to help people. You're a little bit further east, um, you know, in that area where people are looking for timberland. Um, right. you know, versus, Deep east Texas. <laughs> yeah. Versus maybe a little closer to Huntsville yeah. where, where we're at. It's not always people buying for timber versus more so recreational. And I think you've been a real asset also being over in Lufkin in case we have somebody, you know, last minute that wants to go look at a property over there that, um, you know, we haven't been able to, to accommodate and, and you've been able to do that. So it's been great Appreciate having you that. as an agent, um, you know, in a, in a different location. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. It's a little easier for me to get into that deep yeah. East Texas area where it is more of a timber, yeah. timber type resource. Yeah. yeah. Well, how about we talk about your, you know, experience as a, a forester, uh, you know, I guess maybe just tell people like the whole process of if, if they own a property and how they sell their timber and what that whole process is. Yeah, so just a little more background, um, probably maybe just to help people understand the whole business and kind of where right now we're, I would say we're in a market that is oversupplied mm -hmm. in timber. And to understand why we're there, we probably just need to go back a little bit and talk about kind of where we've came from. But in the, in the, this may be more information than you guys want, but back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as the country was expanding and, and growing west and cities were coming up, you know, the demand for timber was huge. Yeah. And so throughout the South, they cut all the timber. Yeah. To, to for over 50 years or so, it was all cut to use it for growing the country. And once a tract of timber was cut, usually settlers or, or you know people would come in, buy it for very cheap. Mm -hmm. And because it was the original timber, it was the original soil, the soil was very rich. Yeah. And immediately they would plant a, a, a crop of cotton. Usually it was cotton because mm -hmm. that's a cash crop. And it did really good. That first, that first crop was really yeah. good. But it depletes the soil quickly. Um, you'd have to move on. And then they would turn cows out into it and everything. But the land didn't really come back in trees. It was, it was cultivated. A lot of uh, uh, livestock was put out in the woods. And then about, um, you know, in the Depression and World War II, because of market changes and the war, and the, the soil was sort of being depleted, you know, people just abandoned the land. Hmm. They went to the cities, they went off to war. Yeah. Um, and, and so the land, the, the land was left uh, in large portions. And this, this kind of continued as people moved to cities and suburbs. Um, all this fallow, vacant land seeded in, a lot of it did, into what we call, uh, you know, old field pine. That's what we call oh, it yeah. in forestry. And it comes up real thick and it would be kind of uh, not great grade and, and uh, you know, grew real slow because it was so thick. And what happened is as the country really grew from like the 50s on, suburb, suburbia and all yeah. the development, a lot of the companies that produce forest products say, you know, we don't really have the timber we need hmm. to supply all of this uh, this growth and yeah. so they bought lots and lots of land and uh, really went into intensive forest man that's kind of where forestry started yeah intensive forest management and um, I remember in in uh, forestry school we went to uh, uh, we, we spent a whole summer doing some field station. You go visit all these different foresters. And Champion Paper, we went and visited a, a forester with Chan. He had this huge track of land. And uh, he was managing. He said, now look, he said, we're planting all these trees. These are genetically superior loblolly pine seed. Called, we call them super trees. And we're planting this many per acre. And it's, you know, it's a bunch of trees per acre. And we really want to get a good first thinning out of it in like 12 or 13 years. And we, we want to take that to the paper mill. And then, uh, and then we space them out. 
and we leave these trees kind of spaced out. These are, these are super trees. Yeah. And we want them to turn into a plywood log within like the next eight years. And we'll cut those and send them to the plywood mill. Well, as we all know, paper is not even really used anymore, right? Yeah. So, you know, the markets keep changing mm -hmm. and they, and another, another change in the market was plywood. Yeah. You know, plywood has been replaced by oriented strand board. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the ply, there used to be a lot of plywood mills in East Texas. There used to be a lot of paper mills in East Texas, but those mills have closed. And OSB mills don't need as big a tree as plywood. It's a product where they chip it and glue it together. It's a good product, Yeah, can be used like plywood but it uh, doesn't require a big tree, mm -hmm. just a bunch of, you know, pulpwood type trees. Yeah. And those, like, what's the average age of that? Yeah, what that's, you yeah, you know, those are going to be a lot of your plantation thinnings uh, from 12 to 20 years old, let's okay. say. And, and they chip that, chip those up and make uh, OSB. So those, the markets keep changing. We get all the way to now. And um, when a landowner sells their timber, say in the 90s, mm -hmm. it was uh, for plywood logs. There was a robust market for, for, uh, for paper. So it was a good pulpwood sales and thinnings. And you, you, we would sell that timber, buy it on bulk price. And there was a real robust demand for it. And uh, since, the great since 2010 or so the markets have changed so when a landowner now uh, has timber to sell there's still foresters and forestry companies and we can help landowners with uh, connecting them to good mm -hmm. forestry companies yeah. that do sell timber and it's generally not on a bulk lump sum type sale anymore now mm -hmm. we it's generally sold by the ton and uh, some of that is because of the way they can weigh timber now. And, uh, but mainly it's just an efficient way for the buyer and the seller to be able to uh, get that wood to the market. Right. And so you really need, uh, it really helps to have a forestry company that, that is in the business and they do it, you know, they're selling a lot of timber. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and when, when a landowner uh, sells, t sells timber now, like I said, they're doing it on a per ton and they sometimes have to kind of get in line. Yeah. Um, the forestry company will inventory your timber. They'll tell you kind of the plan and what mm -hmm. you're going to be able to sell. And, uh, you know, when they think they'll be able to get you worked in to get a logger, yeah. to cut it so it it is uh like when you're in an oversupplied market yeah that's that's kind of the way it is but there's and we may talk about this too but there's from a forester's perspective and i think foresters in real estate especially we need to be looking at timber differently yeah than we used to it's no longer about you know what that timber is worth on the back of a log truck anymore mm -hmm. There's a lot of other values mm -hmm. to timber, which we, we can get into. Yeah. 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 Well, I know, I know, especially in our area, I think timber is more valuable on the stump yes. uh, from a recreational, aesthetically pleasing perspective. Um, so, you know, we come, people come to us and they say, well, you know, I'm going to pay this much money for a property, but what's the timber worth? And, you know, I, I think that there's a value to be put there just for the aesthetic mm -hmm. purposes of, of timber now. You know, a lot of people would, would you rather buy a property that's been clear cut and you don't have to pay for that timber? Or would you rather buy a property that's got, you know, huge saw logs on it, um, you know, that are pretty and provide shade and you've probably got more, you know, animals running about. So I think there's a, you know, value to be had there too, for sure. Yeah, there's a, uh, it's an article, I think it's in Texas Monthly, I'm not sure, but a property was sold in just north of Nacogdoches, about 2,500 acres recently. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it was bought by a company that builds golf courses. Oh, I've heard about this. Yeah. Yeah. And they built Bandon Dunes in Oregon and yeah. and a lot of very nice. And the guy that was in charge of the group that bought the 2500 he was like, I cannot believe there's such a beautiful property in Texas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, deep East Texas, all of East Texas is really, it's a lot of rolling hills, a lot of sand. They're, the little creeks are, are very clear, spring fed. And the timber, when it gets mature, is beautiful. And this yeah. particular track had a good mixture of mature timber and, you know, big hardwoods and, and pines. And, and that's, a tr like you said, aesthetically pleasing. That timber yeah. has a lot of value standing there. That group might not have bought a property if it was all 12-year-old super trees. Right. You know, they're yeah. just... It's it, a different it, look, too. I mean, that, yeah. that's a whole different aesthetic look versus kind of more of a natural stand of timber um yeah that's got some some of the really big um we call them pasture pines i have a few of those at my house and i i love them but they're not great for timber production right yes um but yeah but those are they're super they're pretty and then you have in the hardwood so i mean i definitely still have people that like more of the pine plantation look but it's completely different too right. um, but there's still value in in that pine plantation with them on the stump too you know they're going to grow and then maybe you do manage it here and there for timber do some thinnings and then you can get it looking to a point of maybe a little bit more natural um, as you do thinnings and understory burns right right and the uh whereas that example you know of the the, the inter champion paper guy producing a ton of fiber how much fiber can we produce yeah I think more now it's a longer rotation, which, you know, rotation is just how long you let the tim timber stand there yeah. uh, before you harvest. And there's a lot of products that are still, if you're looking at it from a monetary standpoint, there's a lot of uh, uh, like a logs on the back of the truck. There's, there's more value as that timber ages. And one product or one interesting thing that's happening in, uh, is the restoration of longleaf pine. Mm -hmm. There's a big push with uh, conservation groups and there's some government money out there for landowners who want to plant longleaf pine. And because, uh, you know, a lot of that original timber that was cut was longleaf. Yeah. And so, the, and, and loblolly was what they genetically engineered. It's mm -hmm. a very versatile tree. You can plant it bare rooted and it, it survives a lot of different soils. Yeah. Longleaf's different. It has to be uh, generally planted with some soil like containerized seedling. Yeah. And you can't really genetically uh, change them very right. much. But it's a a beautiful tree. It's very it's very resistant to southern pine beetles because mm -hmm. of the and any kind of beetles because yeah. it produces a lot of pitch. Okay. And so as soon as a beetle starts going, it, pitches that beetle out. So you don't have to worry about bugs as much. It's okay. very resistant to, to fire. Yeah. And then, um, and it needs some fire as it comes up and it, as it, as it matures, it becomes a very beautiful stand under yeah. aesthetically pleasing stand yeah. because it's these nice straight. It's another thing about long leaf. It grows very straight. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then the, the leaves as the, name says long leaf oh, yeah. and it has big bunches of needles and so it's very pretty and yeah. has a nice layer of needles under it's just pretty for people but as it matures and grows straighter and taller it's uh it's really useful for for transmission poles okay and those are always needing to be replaced that's probably yeah. our as far as monetary value yeah. of uh, timber, the most valuable product in a stand of timber right now is transmission poles because oh, wow. those have to be replaced. Yeah. Well, Longleaf makes a perfect transmission pole because hmm. it's straight and uh, as straight as an arrow. Yeah. So that's, uh, and there's money out there for landowners to do that, but the landowner just has to be a little more long range yeah. thinking about these things. Well, so you said that for say this engineered lob lolly for uh, OSB, it takes maybe 12 to 20 years. What would you say for for a, a lob lolly to get to saw log conventional lumber size? How long does that typically take? Yeah, so typically on a lob lolly stand, 
uh, and all the seedlings now Loblolly are genetically superior. Yeah. Uh, and so about 12 years, they need to be ha generally they'll need to be thinned or could be thinned at mm -hmm. 12. That can, that can go all the way to about 18, 20 years. Yeah. And that first thinning is a row thinning, and that's definitely a per ton sale. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that timber gets thinned out. And let's say you do it at 15 years. Well, your, your next thinning should be at about 23 to 25 years old. Okay. Now that thinning is going to have some pulp wood, but it's going to have chip and saw, which is a, a um, it's bigger than pulp wood, a little smaller than a saw log. You know, it goes to the mill. Usually, get two by fours out of it, and then okay. chip the rest. Yeah. And then there will be some what we used to call plywood logs, but now they're lumber logs. Yeah. Um, when I say plywood logs, it's plywood and lumber. Um, that's just a tree that you get more dimensional, dimensional type lumber out of. And, yeah. And and then if you're if you're really just doing a kind of the old fashioned, let's produce as much fiber as we can mm -hmm. and produce as much, say, uh, dollar amount in the shortest amount of time. Well, at 30 years or 32, you, you probably would consider clear cutting that track. Yeah. And at that point in time, that mature timber is uh, is all saw logs. Yeah. And uh, and saw logs, lumber lumber logs. Obviously, worth more than chip and saw, worth more than pulp wood, but they're not as valuable as as we've seen in the past. Right. You get to that say forty year old tree, if it's done right, then you get into a product where they can cut some large pilings out of it yeah. and posts. There's some uh, molding wood that can be cut. There's some mills that that uh, pay a little more for that little bit bigger. So that longer rotation, yeah. like we're talking about, landowners think about a little bit longer rotation. And then you get into the, uh, uh, if you're growing long leaf, where you can do the poles, mm -hmm. transmission poles, and uh, there's just more products. And so generally- how, how long does long leaf take then? But it, it, like yeah, for them to be considered solid? Probably 30, 35 years, you could okay. get a, um, a, a pole out of it, like okay. a 30 foot, 35 foot. The tree's a lot taller than 35, but yeah. the shortest transmission poles, I think, is 35 feet. Okay. I think they may be 30s, but um, and probably are around 30 years old, a long okay. leaf, if yeah. it's managed correctly. And, yeah. Uh, and it's on a good site. It needs yeah. to be on a, doesn't have to be a great site, but long leaf, that's another good thing about long leaf is it's very, adaptable to some poor sites and okay uh, so like the, the soil they're they're adaptable to yes different soils right yeah right um so in order for all of these things to happen like it's a very extensive and long process and mm -hmm. so do people like bring their whole family in you know like when they're purchasing a piece of property and they're wanting to I guess grow the timber on it. Then do they tell their kids so their kids can continue, you know, doing what <laughs> yeah. they already started? Or like, like, do y'all see that a lot? Or do people just purchase things when they're like eighteen years old and see the growth of all of it? You know? Yeah. I feel. I mean, I feel like it can be generational. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like in the past it most certainly has. Um, I mean, especially for maybe say like the Temple family, a lot of people that we deal with now worked for Temple. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, a family that has passed down kind of this timber business. They're a very, very large example. Uh, but I, I do feel like I see clients, uh, you know, that they've had a property in their family for, you know, years and have managed it here and there for timber. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like kind of at a certain point in time, you know, as it goes down the line, then it may be son, grandson, great grandson, uh, or daughter isn't you know interested in doing that anymore. They never go visit the property, mm -hmm. um, and so you know we, we've had quite a few that end up then selling through us. Um, and like like Scott has said, you know the timber market has changed quite a bit, so you're not seeing you know just a huge return um, yeah. anymore. Uh, so yeah, for people who do still own timberland, uh, you know maybe it has been passed down to them and they're not really sure what to do with it, or maybe somebody that. You know, wants to get into owning a property uh, to manage for timber, kind of on the side, with along with recreation. Uh, so, what would that process be? Who do they need to talk to? 
um, who do they need to hire to help them do that? Yeah, I think if it's, um, say if it's under 50 acres, um, you know, really I would focus more on that timber just being adding value to the property. Yeah. There's not a lot of management that you really need to do um, uh, unless you get, you know, a beetle outbreak or something, then you then you do need to reach out Texas Forest Service or somebody and yeah. try to get some resources to uh, to get get disease timber out or whatever. But really, the small tracks, the aesthetic mm-hmm. uh, aspect of timber it makes a difference. Yeah. So really, the longer you can let your trees grow on smaller tracks, the better. Yeah. Now, once you get over fifty acres and you get into a uh, more commercial type. Uh, ability to to grow and harvest timber, then you do need some professional help, mm-hmm. I believe. And um, there's some great foresters in East Texas, some consulting companies, and uh, like I said, we can help connect mm-hmm. people with those folks. And uh, some of them work on a fee. Some of them will work on a uh, commit. When they sell timber, they'll yeah. they'll charge a commission. But it's good just to probably start out have them come out to the land visit with you yeah and do a timber inventory do a timber if you have mature timber do a timber cruise and that's how you can find out you know what your timber is worth right what yeah. the inventory what you have out there and what it's worth and uh, start that relationship with that forester you know growing timber is a it's not like growing corn it's a long term prospect right yeah. And so it's not like you're going to talk to your forester every month or two months. Right. Or you might see them every couple of years or something. Yeah. But it's good to get that relationship started and, and, and get that base information, especially for mm-hmm. tax purposes and things. It's good to have a basis on right. your timber, uh, which is is a value. Mm-hmm. And when you starting any time, you know, yeah. it's best if you start when you buy the property. Right. And then that consultant will advise you, like we said, with a plan mm-hmm. and what we're going to do in mm-hmm. five years, what we're going to do in 10 years. And, right. and, uh, and then if there is a sale that needs to be done, they'll help you with that. And hopefully the timber market, because there are some other products out there, there are things happening yeah. that uh, timber, timber could, can, could, in, you know, become stronger and, and right. be a, a commodity that is more valuable. We're, we've definitely been in a slump. Yeah. You know, a lot of these timber companies, the big ones that, that I talked about that bought all this land to supply their mills. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of them said, we, we don't need all this land anymore. Right. And starting around 2000, they began to sell all this land. Now, like a company like Warehouser or Rainier, they would tell you, you know, we're just as much in the land business as right. we're in the timber business. Yeah. But um, a lot of those type companies sold out and that also caused an oversupply yeah. of timber. And so that is starting to work its way through the through the market. Mm-hmm. And I think there will be some uh, better demand in, in years to come for yeah. forest products. But also, like carbon credits, mm-hmm. that's a whole market that has been developing for a while. And yeah. basically what a carbon credit is, is like uh, Apple or Exxon says, you know, we produce this much carbon. We put this much carbon in the air right. through our processes, through our mm-hmm. our business. But we're paying these landowners over here a certain amount to yeah. capture that carbon and they're capturing with their trees that they're growing a certain number of tons and and so we're we're even there and they believe that they have a customer base that values that they want to they want to buy products from a carbon neutral business so landowners have an opportunity to sell carbon credits and a forester can help you with that also um something that's gaining a lot of traction right now is mass timber Mm -hmm. and architects and uh, builders are building especially office buildings with this mass timber because their employees like it the clients like it and what it is is just dimensional lumber that's all put out side by side here and then they put a layer on top of that perpendicular to it Mm -hmm. and then a layer on top of that perpendicular and i guess it could just keep going it's like a it's like a big piece of plywood made out of dimensional lumber. 
and then you can cut it. They cut it into beams and yeah. all, and they use it in the walls. They use it on the ceilings and beams. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, the growth is very high with that. There's a lot of new buildings that are being built uh, with mass timber. So that's another... Totally timber, no, no metal or... Yeah, they, like they're that. replacing concrete yeah. and steel with this timber. Yeah, oh, that's I pretty cool. I know that. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, so that market is growing and there is a good... I think there's reason to be hopeful. Yeah. I just think landowners uh, just have some patience. Think about, talk to your forester about that longer rotation. Mm -hmm. A long leaf time. Yeah. Um, is there anything else I wanted to add? Um, uh, I liked the history that you threw in there too. That was pretty. Oh, neat. okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That was good. Yeah. If there's something you guys think of that I haven't mm -hmm. said, mentioned, tell me, but I, I can't really think of yeah. anything else right now. I think it's good for today. Yeah. yeah we can always do another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, thanks, Scott, for joining us today and telling us all about timber. We know that you're probably the expert here. Mm -hmm. um, so we appreciate all the insight. Um, I learned a lot, yeah, even me that, too. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know. And I, I, I think I have a, just a kind of practical knowledge of timber working with you and Andy and, um, you know, selling timberland, but it's, it's totally different from an actual forester's perspective mm -hmm. and knowledge. So that's really neat to hear about. Well, I appreciate it. It's been fun. Yeah. Yeah. Good. good. We're glad. Um, if y'all are interested in learning more about timber, we would invite y'all to join us at the Texas Forestry Association annual conference. Uh, this year it is towards the end of October and it's going to be held in Conroe, uh, but they do an annual conference every single year that we always attend. Um, there's lots of speakers and networking and it's a great time. So y'all should join us and uh, tune in for our next round episode. Thanks. Bye. Bye.